this is only recommended for the semester. Right? So we talked a little bit about that as well. All right. Another thing I want to put out there before we talk about the NCL is what are we gonna going to use to hold characters this semester? We will not ask you to use char anymore because, remember C++ on top of C, provide you a very rich standard library. String is from that standard library. Remember that's from C where you have, um, where you have an array, right? And then you define how many letters you want that to hold, and then you put in their characters and their letters in there in double quotes, right? So whenever there's double quotes, it's when you want it to be at text. Not numbers, not quotes. In the storage, it will look something like this, right? You have C0, that would be A, C1, that would be B, C2, would be C, and C3 would be D. Right? Remember that from C? We will not be doing that anymore because whenever you need to um, Whenever you need to add something, or append something, or remove something, you have to operate in the sense of an array, right? Where, okay, I'm going to add two cells into this array, I'm going to put this in there. When you are comparing them, you need to put as two arrays, right? You compare one cell at a time. We don't need to do any of that. If we use this object, or class, or type, called string, provided in the C++ center library. And you can see the namespace is std, so std com, com it's from the std namespace string. This represents a sequence of characters. So remember before, an array holds a sequence of characters. Now one single string object is equivalent to your whole array. Okay? So I'm going to show you how to use string to do a pair, compare, how to get the length of your string, and how to grab specific characters if you still want to from the string. All right, first example, a pet. This is probably the first one that we show you what my file looks like, right? At the very beginning, you do includes, to include whatever library you're gonna, do, uh, you're gonna have. So string, you need to make sure you include that, otherwise you won't be able to use it. Our string is what we'll talk about today, so don't worry about that. Using names with SD is what I recommend for this semester. Here's my name. This is how you initialize string. You just give it a name. You don't tell it how long it is. You don't give it a size. You don't treat it as an array anymore. You treat it as an object, right? So this variable, first name, is of type string, equals to however many letters you want to include. It could be length four like this. It could be a super long one. It's fine. Okay, so as long as however long you want it to be, you can just assign the value to it. Similar to down here, the last name, it's a three letter uh, value, which is fine as well. Here's how you will append. Okay, so if I want to have John space though, append it together as one single string, you use the plus operator. Whenever you have plus operator in between strings objects, it will do a pen, okay? So appending is super easy. I have another string named full name, that will be my first name variable, plus the space, plus last name, semicolon, dot, okay? So we will talk about CL next week, but treat this as a print statement for now. So I'm printing full name, column, space, and then the value of full name is John space, right? So that is append in strings, and this is compare. For you to compare, you just compare as integers or floats. Compare as any numbers that you will do, equal, equal sign, okay? So if you do first name, equal, equal to last name, it will return true if they're exactly equal, and it will return false otherwise, all right? Some of you remember that you have to call some function compare, or you have to do a loop to compare the string, you don't need to do that anymore. Okay, for string objects, equal equal will tell you whether two strings objects are equal. Mm -hmm. All right, 
there are two ways to get size. The example that I screenshot here is string object dot size. What this is calling is that I'm going to grab the size function that tell me the size of this variable. So variable name dot function name parentheses. So it doesn't take any parameters or empty parentheses. Okay. This gives you how long that string is. Equivalently, you can also call full name dot length. Same thing, it will tell you how long that um, variable is. Now you wonder, well, if they're the same, why do you have two? One thing that I also want to introduce to you uh, for this class is code readability. Okay? You can name all your variable A, 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 B, B, B. It doesn't make any sense. If you have good memory, the next day you come back, you know exactly what you wrote. I bet after a year you come back, you have no idea what you just wrote. Okay? Right now, you've all been doing things individually. Even right after you transfer, you will start to do group projects. That is when your code needs to be readable by other people who have no idea what you just wrote. Okay? So your code readability becomes very important. Therefore, when software engineer designs the plus plus as a language, they also have that in mind. If people think full main dot length is more readable, people do that. Which for me, length is length makes more sense. We also people who think size makes a lot more sense. So yeah, people can see that. You could also see that I have started to do inline comments. This is also something that I want you to start doing this semester. Okay? That will be a requirement for you to have some sort of inline comment in every single one of your projects. I <coughs> want that to start becoming a habit. Even right now, when I'm hiring for my team, people link their repository, which is a software engineer profile page, on their resume. I go in there, I look at whether their code is readable, whether they have inline comments, whether they document what they're writing so that other software engineers come in and collaborate with them. Okay? Very important for your career. So I want you to kind of start getting into that. Yes, question? Does dot size return like the length of the string array, or is it the, like the actual like amount of? That's a very good question. Size and length both return how many characters in there. Just the actual length of how many letters in there, not the memory size. Okay. Yeah. But size of does memory size. Yes, yeah, size of yes, which we talked about last week. Yeah. Okay. So here's a few example where after you get home, you can type it in and try this out. This. Uh, this is how I like to show my code example. I'll show you a snippet, right? Just a portion of it. Each time I zoom in, talk about each line. At the end, I'll give you the full script. I'll be like, okay, this is where everything together uh, that you can actually type in in, uh, in your code, in your uh, in your VS code. Okay. So if you want to review this very quick, include statement at the top, include all the libraries, use the namespace for this semester only. Main, my string variable first name, my string variable last name, appending first name, space, last name, into a new variable, full name, print it out to make sure that we got it correctly. Comparison, equal, equal is good enough for us to compare two string objects, size or length. Right? This is how you will get the size or the length of this specific variable. And this is how I print return zero. Okay. Alright, so and at the bottom I also will try to include expected output, so when you write it, when you run it on your machine, you will know what you're expecting, right? Whether to examine whether you correctly code the I have a question. Yes. The way you have named your variables, like the capital L in the middle of the first name? Name list, I'm sorry. Oh. Yes, so for all of your projects, this is this is what I call a signature of a software engineer, right? There are people who like to have underscore. You can have name underscore length, still readable. We also have people do name like the last the next word they would do capital to know that this is two words. The the reason that we don't capitalize the first letter because that is for classes. 
So the second half of the semester, you will see that everything that have a first day that capitalized is a class. So that's special for C. So we don't, we don't care. So we always start with lower case. For me, um, I like to have that for variable name and underscore for function name. That's for me. That's how I like to code. Um, it's up to you. I know for project assignment, I give you specific variable name and be like, please name it that way. It's because I don't, I have a script to code your project. Okay, so I don't go in and read everything. And last week, last semester, I had about 200 students. There's no way I could do that while I work here hours a day. So my script will look for those variables and will tell me how much you got. That is the only reason that telling you specifically how you name your variable. But you can figure out how you like. It's not required for you. One caveat for string. String is not good with something we call bound checking. Remember in the array you have a specific size, char 50, right? Square dot 50 or char 2. Where string is an object, like I said, you don't need to restrict how many letters you put in there. It could be 4, it could be 8, it could be 40. That means that you really don't know what the size of a string object is by just looking at it. Okay. Therefore, when people are trying to grab a specific index from the string, they also don't know what's the max index they can grab. Very easily, I could write something like this, where both of my first name and last name are just four letters, but I'm trying to grab index five, which doesn't exist in my string, right? But if you look at the output here, it just have empty, doesn't do anything, return, and done. Okay. This time you're like, wait, wait, I printed out, I asked you to do five, there's nothing there, what do you need? There's actually nothing. So if you look at computer memory, okay, you can think of it as a giant storage, where in there, there you have cells, okay, like that. So when I have, say, string first name, it would be like, okay, first name, start here, yeah, V, A, G, N, and then it would be like, okay, last name, all right, last name, start here. But it has more. So I'm trying to get the fifth one. Uh, actually, zero, one, two, three, four, five, here. I'm trying to get that. It is empty. So is there an error? Uh, you know, it depends who you ask. If you ask your VS Code, no, you're good. If you ask Visual Studio, Visual Studio are all good, right? It's very forgiving, like I said. Therefore, you won't know that, oh, I'm actually requesting, sorry, here, yeah. oh. You won't know that you're actually requesting a non-existent letter from a short string. However, <coughs> string class did implement another function that is good with it, and that function is called at. So if you do first name dot at five, you like grab me the index five letter. It'll give you a lot of error. Be like, no, 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 no. I don't know what you're talking about. Out of range. Okay, basic string, blah, 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 blah. By the way, I do want to show you how complicated C error message could get and how unuseful and undirectional it is. Um, so if a lot of time people send me an arrow and be like, my project is not that. What's going on? I'll look at it and I'll be like, this is what happened. You're like, Did you just do magic? How do you figure out? You know how when you read a language and you encounter words that Auto you do not understand? Just skip them. But I don't know what that is. Terminated. Yeah, I know that. What's uncaught, etc. I don't know what that means. Oh, out of range. They understand. Right? So there are some words in that I would tell you what caused the arrow. 
once you learn more and more of C++, you will understand more, more and more portion of this one. At the end of the semester, we'll teach you how to write exceptions. So by that time, you'll be like, okay, um, you will know what uncut exception means, you will know, um, like, uh, I don't think, yeah, exception of type, you will know what that means, because we'll be that. But for now, it will tell you out of range, good enough. Okay, so try your best to read your error message um, when you encounter it. So let's get back at the index. The function at 5, or at parentheses, is good with bound checking, only if you use it. Though. A lot of people are very familiar with the square bracket indexing, but remember that one is not good with bound checking for strip. Okay, so here's some reviewing. This is something that would be helpful for the long run. CD, uh, this, again, this will always show up when you run your code to tell you in terminal what the US code does for you, right? Meaning that if you don't use VS code, you need to do this yourself. You type those in. So the first thing is CD, that is where you find your project. G++ is G++ is when you um, G++ is when you compare your code dash o in output to a file name example. This is auto generated. You see that it's always the same as your file name. Finally, compile uh, run this executable image called example. Okay. All right. Now we're finally ready. So the library, other than Spring, that we talked about, that we want to check input, output, stream, okay? So for IO stream, input, output, stream. In here, there are three things that we're going to cover. SCDCN for input, SCDCout for output, SCDNLine, end of line. So today, we only have time to cover CN. Next week, we'll cover C out and end of line, okay? Okay. I'd like to start then with a summary. Um, and as the class gets further and further along, my summary will become more and more wordy. Because that is everything that we want to talk about for this library or for this function. If you look at it and be like, what? It's, it's fine. Right, we're going to go over it every single step in detail. At the end of the class, if you look at this, you don't want to, you should know a lot more. Okay? All right, what's SDDCN? For SDDCN, we always have this arrow. This is actually called um, extraction operator, which we'll talk about uh, details later. But now just remember this symbol always happens after CN, okay? When you are doing a CN, there are three total steps. Reading, transmitting, and store. So reading is when you're typing things in your terminal, your code needs to read from the terminal. Transmit is that once you read it from the terminal, it needs to store in a temporary location and that location is called buffer. And the last one, the store, is once you have it in a temporary location, you then want to parse them into different types of variables, integer string, or code, or okay? At the end here, when I talk about store, this is when you parse it, right? When you are parsing and inspecting each of the character, uh, there's breaking point called the limiter. The limiters, including space, text, and new lines, are all considered the limiter for CN. When they see one of that, it will pause. Okay? All right. Let's look at one example. The first example is, is pretty straightforward. You have three variable, integer i, double d, string x. Okay, these are three variables. 
For any CN, you need to tell people what you're expecting them. I know that we are, this is probably the first or second programming class that you're taking, means that you have all been writing code for yourself. However, that's not the goal. Your goal is to write a software for users. Imagine you go onto a website, there's two spaces there for you to fill with no instruction. Okay? How are you going to use the software? You won't be able to, right? The software engineer will program that need to be like username first, password second, right? Then you go, oh, okay, I need to type in username, I need to type in password. When you're typing something wrong, you can like, make sure your password is length A, right? Instruction everywhere when you are using any software, which is what you will need. So for CN, for input, you really need to tell the user what you're expecting. So I'm expecting an integer, a double, and a string, okay? Down here, I will have the code CN, you see the symbol, okay? This is extraction operator, which is just two greater signs stick together. First variable, i, I'm gonna read in to i, which is an integer, and then to a double d, and then to a string s. Okay? Let's see how it works. When I first run it, this will get printed out, right? CI is just a print statement now. All right, here is my CN. From lab one, you should all be able to do terminal now. If you did not finish lab one, right, the last slide of lab one is saying that change output to terminal is because if you don't do that, you won't be able to type it in. You have to be in terminal for you to type CN, okay? We see that I'm in terminal, I'm typing negative 45 space, 2.35 space, this is actually a tab, AC, that's why I typed in. And I press enter. Enter will start transmit. Okay? That means your computer, your code, will take everything that you just entered in that line transmit it into a buffer space, object stream. And this object stream is called CN. That's what it means, okay? So stream is an object, looks something like that. If you, you can see like very similar, right? It's just a space in the storage. But this space is allocated for an object stream specifically used for CN. <coughs> Okay, so I do transmit, transmit, everything in, file wise. In addition, there's a new line, right? Remember when you type things, when you press enter, it's a new line, right? So it doesn't only start to transmit, it still will add the new line for you. The next time you start typing, it will be the next line. So it's everything you have typed so far, with the new line character in there. Transmit it into CN stream. Yes? So we have to manually put the code in the terminal? Yes, yes. So I type in negative 45 space, 3.25, yeah. And then press enter. Yes. So those are input, right? The expected input you're expecting user to type in, or the computer expecting me to type in. All right, so after transmit, <coughs> store. Now it's ready to your code. If you look at the code, the first thing we ask CN to extract, we ask the computer to extract from CN stream is integer i, okay? How does the computer know which part is i? It will just try its best, okay? It reads negative, like this is an integer, is is this possible to make it to be integer? Yeah, okay, I'll move on. Okay, it'll read four. Okay, that should be an integer, good. Read five, that's also a legit integer. I also set that. And then it finds a white space. A space is part of the delimiter, meaning that it will stop there, okay, and pause, pause the reading for that. After that it pause, what it's gonna do is look back. Okay, I, they just read a negative, a number four, and a number five. 
it's gonna bundle everything together into a valid integer. Okay, and then 45 is a valid integer. Put it all together, store it into Apple. Okay? Then it's gonna look for the other extraction operator. Okay? Meaning that you're done with I, hold on, there's more to do. Continue to <coughs> extract D. What is a D? D is a double. Alright, that's D. So skip the delimiter, right? Continue because there's more to do. We're reading a double. Let's check. Is two possibly a double? Yeah, that's a number. How about the decimal? Is that a possible double? Yeah, it's fine. Right? It's three fine. Yes, it's five fine. Yep. Oh, tap. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Review everything that I just processed. 2.5. Put them all together. Store it in D. Look at your code to see whether you want it to continue to extract. Yes, straight, right? Now look at the string, and look at A, A the string, yep, C, yep, E, yes. New line is also the limiter, so we'll pause right there, wrap A, C, E, turn in S. And then is there anything else we need to see to do? No. Okay, finish. Done. All right. Okay, so before I move on, uh, when we talk about C out, you will see another symbol that is, oh, right here. This is what you use for C out. For the longest time, I've been confused. Why does this point that way and the other one point this way? Like, what? Can I just change it? I want C to point this way. And that one point. No, there's a reason, right? For C in, what you're doing is you're grabbing things from here, store it in I. So the arrow points that way. Right? Store in I, store in D, store it in S. When we talk about C out, you will see that we're not storing, we're extracting. Okay? So that's why the arrow points. So for C in, it always goes to into the variable names. Okay, cannot change it. It doesn't work. All right, so this is my way example. Again, you can write this up at home and then see whether you got it right. Example two. So the first one, we put everything in one line. I input in one line. I store in one line. How about I break it apart? Does that mean anything? So this time, it's going to say C in I, but this time, I'm only going to enter 4, I'm going to press enter. The minute you press enter, we have that, 4 new line, right? Store it. And then the computer, your compiler will start looking at line 11 to see whether there's an extraction operator, right? There is. And we're asking it to go into i, i is an integer, so it will start do that first. This is it, yes. A delimiter, wrap it, store. Now, there's nothing else in CN, right? However, if they go back into your code and read the next line, you're asking CN to extract more. But there's nothing more. What's going to happen is that your computer will wait for you. So if you run this code from your machine, you will see that it's going to be waiting right here for you to type in something. If you don't type it in, it's just going to wait there. Okay? So when I do C and D and S, I'm going to finally type in 2.35 because it waited long enough. All right, I type in that, I press enter. It's going to store 2.35 right after my 4 and one. Remember, storage is just a group of sets. Okay? It always go one after the other. So once I use the first two, I'm just going to use the third one to store my next thing. Alright, it's going to check 2.35, delimiter, wrap it, store it. Then it's going to wait for me again. 
because this half is waiting for me to put things in there for S. So I put an ACE, drop it, You have noticed breaking into multiple line doesn't really matter. Entering into multiple line also doesn't really matter. Right? So I can enter it in three different lines, I can put it all in one line, all the same. Whenever it's in stream, it looks exactly the same. Right? It's just in storage. Alright, so give it a try once you get home. Now you wonder if we always have space, always have the limiter in there, why does the computer bother to check type? I'm always going to put a space between integer and float. And I'm always going to put the space between the second float and the last string. I mean, yeah, that's what I will ask you to do. Do you always do what people ask you to do? That, right? You don't, you can't expect your user to do exactly what you do. And the programming language also is trying to be fault tolerant. Meaning, that if I did not type in the space, I do two, three, five, five A, C, E, raspberry, no space, nothing in between, okay? It's gonna be fine because it will still do head checking. So transmit, right, everything into stream. First thing is integer I, check two, check three, check five, check eight. No longer integer, stop. Wrap everything we have so far, put in an I, Continue. The only difference is it will not skip it. It will just read starting A. The only thing that it will skip and not read is the limiter. Space, text, and new line. If it's a letter, it will just continue. Okay, so it will read A line. C, E, new line, that is a delimiter. Okay, pause, wrap, store in there. It's fine. Okay, so it reads everything perfectly and then it can parse it out. Yeah? So that's why the type checking is still important. Alright, next example. Um, what if I type in something with space in there that I don't want it to ignore? So let's look at this one. I put in ACE space SPACE and I'm expecting it to read everything when you get it. Right? Because it will transmit, parse string, find the Y space. That is a delimiter. Stop right there. Wrap ACE. Ignore the rest. Because you never ask it to extract again. You only ask it to extract it once. It's just going to do it once. It's going to ignore everything else that you type in and abandon it. Okay, so what happens when you have more things left in your screen? Nothing's gonna happen. Okay, once you reach return zero off your program, everything you've created in the program trash, done, empty, flush. Okay, it's just gone, gone forever. All right. Now, what if I do want that? I do want the whole thing. I don't want it to just stop at space tags and you know, I want it to read the whole line. Yes, there's a function called get line. Get line will get you the whole line. Now get line is a function, okay, you can see it here. That I, if I have using names with STD, you don't need to do STD column column get line. If you don't have that, make sure you still do the namespace, okay? Namespace, scope operator, which is a column column, get line. All right, so the get line will take in two parameters. Input stream, which is our CN, okay? Your variable that you want to get the line and store into. Now this time, because you have the get line function, it will ignore the limiter. It will only break at new line. Because you said get line, you get multiple lines, okay, so multiple lines, right? So it will only stop when there's a new line. It will include a space as a string, include tag, 
as a string. So continue to read all the way until there's a new line character. So this time I can read the full thing and store it in a string. So that is SPD get line function. How about I don't want it to automatically read everything that I type in. I want to specifically handle one character at a time. You can do that. That is function called cin.get. Now cin.get is a member function of Spring, so that is why when you call it, you don't just do std get. That's something different. You're getting one character at a time from this stream object named cin. So cin.get. All right, let's look at this example. So this example is asking you to enter three letters. Okay, so I entered three letters. The first thing I entered was abc. All together, no space. Okay, this is the first one I entered. Press enter, transmit, into C in stream. And we have a for loop. The for loop will run exactly three times, right? I equals to zero to start with, I less than three, that's the condition to stop, I plus plus, that's the incremental step. The letters will hold one character at a time from C in dot get. So the first time I run this, it will become A. Letter will be A. I'm asking it to print out that letter with a space. Okay, so now that's A space. Continue on. I'm gonna read the next letter character from CN <coughs> into this variable letter. That would be B now. It's gonna print out B space. So A space, B space. And then finally, we're going to read it the third time, grab C, C out, so A space, B space, C space, you can see it, okay, so space. Finish that, new line, return zero, okay? So you learn how to get one single uh, character, how to get the whole line, and how you just ask, ask it to automatically parse. Either way it works. What about you wanted to skip? C in dot ignore. Okay. Scene super common. When you are when you are reading a document or something using a C plus plus code. When people write things, they will use comma, they will use period, they will use quotes. <coughs> All those to segment the information. Right? So it's super common where you have uh, a number and you want to spread it by the name, people do comma space, all right? So I'm going to handle that when I have my two plus plus read that. You can have it read as it is, right? And ignore specific link from the string. Where here, I want to ignore two, right? I want to ignore the comma, I want to ignore the space. So here's how we do it. So first of all, I'm going to ask it to see in H, right? H is an integer, so the computer, I mean, first of all, it will transmit and put everything in there, so we're pretty familiar with it by now. Now, it will look at 25, right? 2 and 5 are both integer, but not comma. So the minute that's being got here, it knows to stop. So wrap 2 and 5, put it in H, and then run 14. So 14 is asking it to ignore two spaces. It will start ignoring right here. Okay, so this is the first thing that got ignored. This is the second thing. Ignore two will ignore those two and continue the reading from this one, J. All right? And what I want is the full name. I don't want it to do Jane, uh, John and John only. <coughs> John, I want the space, I want the dough. That is where we can use get line. Use get line to get the name. And that's how you will then read something that is unexpected that you can ignore. Okay, okay so that's the end. Uh, inside our string, C 
scale automatically. Parsing, pause as a limiter, you can get line. If you have a not pause as space or text, it will only pause any line. You can have a lucene.get to parse, process one character at a time if you want to. You can use lucene.ignore to ignore a specific link. One question. Yes. We're seeing ignore. Uh, number define the size of the <coughs> part you want to cut out. Mm -hmm. But how do we know when or where it starts? This cut? Yeah, so it will start right after. Right? Like after two characters. No, no. So the reason that it starts here yeah. is because the first thing we ask it to do is an integer. Uh, integer, okay. Right? Okay. Meaning it. that your yeah, CA yeah. will parse it. Integer, integer, no, integer, no, no, no. Stop right there, wrap it, and then Ignore, wait. Yeah. And then wait there, be like, okay, what do you want me to do with this comma? Do you want me to store in the string? Do you want me to skip it? Like, what do you want me to do? Then they come here. Oh, ignore two. Okay, ignore, ignore, wait. You will wait here again. Then go back. Oh, okay, get line. And then it will continue all the way to new line. Stop that. Yes. It was waiting there the whole time. Any other question? Yeah. So for the, um, the sin get or c in get. C in dot get. In dot get. Um, mm -hmm. I have a question about the loop. Would you have to type in your input every time because the c in dot is the c in dot get the like the call for an input? Yes. So, so that is why the loop only runs three times. So each three times you'd have to write A B C? Oh no no no, 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 no. First time. no no no. So I type all those in Once. together and then press mm -hmm. enter. Right. And then because this loop only ran three times, because I put three here, right. I code it in, it will try to read three letters. Right. So if this is four or five, it will wait for me and ask me to enter more. Okay. Because it's only running three times for this for loop, it will only read three characters and stop. So I don't need to type it in all at once. I could mm -hmm. do A, enter. It's going to wait for me. It's going to be like, OK, two more. I could type, OK, fine. B, enter. Be like, come on, one more. And I type C, enter. It's the same thing as this. So, can, so C in dot get can only be used within a loop? No. Of... If you put it out there, it will just run once. <laughs> OK. But so what I'm saying is because C in, so C in dot get is what calls for an input, mm -hmm. wouldn't that ask for an input three times as well? Or why does it only ask for an input once? Oh, I started asking. So that's a good question because the storage and then asking for input are separate. So the storage, which is the stream, it's by itself. It's tucked away somewhere it's there. <coughs> no matter how long I type in or how short I type in, uh, it's not going to impact mm -hmm. what your code tells the end to do. So basically, um, its letter is, or well, wherever the string came from is already declared? This is already declared, yes. So c, c in dot get doesn't ask for input? It, no. Okay. It's trying to grab from here. So would The it reason be? that it asks for input is if it runs out. But your code is asking it to get again. That is when it will wait for you. That's the only time it will wait. So if there's more, we'll just continue until it's done. And if you only ask it to run twice, even though you enter three letters, it's just going to ignore it. So they are separate, yeah. The input is what you type to store in here. cn.get or cn, like the extraction operator, are the one that you're grabbing from here. So as long as there's sufficient information that the end can grab, it's not going to ask for input. Okay. Only when they run something. So does that mean there had to have been a C in before in, in that code, where it's like C in, enter three letters? Ah, very yeah. good question. So remember we talked about storage? Yeah. The minute you press enter, um, but yeah, so like,
like first of all, the first time you have CN in your code anywhere, right? That will create this. I mean, how long is this? We don't know. Okay, so we don't know how long that is. And then because of this, three letters exist in your code, no matter you're calling dot get or you're having uh, CN insert. We don't have it here. <coughs> like if you have a CN insert here, the first time you call that, right? It's going to wait at the terminal for me to type in something. It doesn't have control how many I type in. I could type in 10 letters. And then okay? no matter how many times like a loop gets re or, yeah, reiterated with C in in it, it still yeah. counts as one C in? Yeah, that's right. Yes. That's a very good question. Yes, so this is a little interesting because normally when you have a storage, you define it first, right? Int i, go j. Very good question. For C in, you don't. The first time you use CN from STD, it's actually already defined in STD. It will just be ready. Has the storage for you to transmit whatever you have in there. So you don't define it, define it. You're extracting from it, depends on what you call after the CN. Yes. And there's no like index number for CN? There is, but um, CN is a special string. So it's not an array or something like that. So for you to go, I want the third one. Mm -hmm. You have to do ignore, ignore, get. Oh, okay. But you, you do have two, right? It's still like three spaces. Okay. If you want to get the third one, you do need to skip two. So it still have indexes, but it's not an array where you can just grab it in the middle. <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, can you use dot get with variables, like letter dot get? That would be a different function. Yeah, it's, so yeah. that function is specifically defined yeah. inside yeah. the stream. Mm -hmm. There's definitely dot get somewhere else, mm -hmm. but they may do completely different things mm -hmm. depends on what where you're calling it from. Mm -hmm. This is calling it from stream, so yeah. this is how it Yeah, if, if we get, for example, from scene before the loop, we get, uh, uh, let's say, these three letters, mm -hmm. and yeah. then in the loop, we use letter dot get. Would that no. no, it's not. Because it's not letter safe. is a. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah. Like that's something different. They may be trying to get, I don't know, an index from it. That. That's something yeah, different. Is, yeah, so we don't know what that is. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, for slide 80, uh, you use std colon colon get line. Yeah. And then in other situations, though this is the only example on the same slide. Oh, uh, yeah. You that use a single just, colon? Just because of that line. I just didn't put it in my screenshot. As long as I have using namespace std at the beginning of the file, you will see that I don't have it anywhere. No, 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 I know, but mm -hmm. sometimes you use two colons, sometimes you use one colon, and I was just wondering what the difference is. Can I use one colon, then I see a typo. Yeah. Uh, okay. Where, what did I use? Oh, slide 80, you said? 80. 80. Oh, 80. On the left side. Oh, oh that's a typo. Oh, okay. Good catch. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Jack. Okay, that we should have two columns. Is there ever a situation where you just use one colon? No, that means something different. Thank you. Two columns together, it's called scope operator. That whole thing is one single operator called scope operator, where you scope and scope. Any other question? Last question for the string. Uh, if you don't, don't use this include uh, string, uh, this header, uh, mm -hmm. If you use string bound in the code, we have to type std. Oh, not for string. String is from here. Yeah, but if we, if we don't include strings, we cannot use strings in the code you or cannot we use cannot at, at all. all. Like at it will all. be unrecognized. What is yeah. this? Oh. It won't know. Oh. It won't know. Yeah. You have to include the library for it to recognize. Oh, this is a type. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, yeah well, I, some, I saw somewhere sometimes it's used std to dot, uh, two columns. String. Is that? Oh yeah, that's probably because this yeah. is in Aha, uh -huh, without name names. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Name spaces. Yeah. Name spaces. That is right. Yes. If you use C in within uh -huh. a for loop, uh -huh. for example, like the one that you had with the three iterations. Uh -huh. If you use C in in that loop, will that ask you for input three times or only once? Depends on whether you have enough. So if you do have enough, it's not going to repeat the i. You just write. 
Well, I meant just just C in by itself, not not C in dot. Um, dot gap. Yeah, just. Like so you're, you're saying if I just have C in in the for for like a string for the loop, right? So yeah. it'll run three times. It's still the same answer, but it will run a little bit differently. So it will still only ask you when it's not enough. So this is still a true statement. But the not enough is defined differently because if because you do like C in integer i, you grab all the letters and think that it's one integer. Mm -hmm. Then I'll run out, right? So it's still when it's determined that it's not enough. Okay. It depends on what I ask you to do. So yeah, so it will depend. Yeah. Depends on the code.
solution, you know? On your VS Code, on the left, just run with the bug icon. We're actually debugging. So whenever you see a bug, that's something related to debugging. Run with a bug. This is debug mode, which is different than the run mode. The regular run mode does not have that bug staying on top of your run. You just run the whole thing. So those two are different. Okay. So here are the screenshots uh, of the first time you configure this. You take the one and debug. It's going to ask you to select from a list. Take this one. And then it asks you to select from another list. Take that one. So this is for Mac. So Windows, oh, this is for Mac, Windows, and Linux. So those are all three different options. So make sure you pick the one first one into your system. Some of you, only some of you, will have this launch.json pop-up automatically populated. It's fine, just close it, don't worry about it, it's okay. okay. Some of you don't, don't panic, you're fine. There's just different version of VS Code. Sometimes they populate, sometimes they don't. Okay. All right, once you set it up, you are ready to debug. Debug, here's a couple steps. One is what we call a breakpoint. The breakpoint, it's between your line number and then the divider, which you cannot see at all. There's a line here. Okay, so here's the line. There's the line number. If you click anywhere in between, if you click here, it's going to be a bridge on a 6, line 6, line 9, line 12, line 15, line 13, and so on. So whenever you click between the line number and then the divider, that is where you put a break. Breakpoint means that your computer will run until that point and wait for your instruction. Okay. Once you have your breakpoint, you can try to debug it. Okay. So the debug run. Make sure you're in debug mode first. Very important. A lot of times, like I don't have this. Well, you need to first be in debug mode, and then this run will show up. So click that. That is the debug run. Right. All right, here's the interface for the debug mode. The minute I click one, overwhelming, I say one at a time. The first thing you will notice that there's this colored, colored line. My color looks absolutely gorgeous from my screenshot, and I don't even know what this color is. Greenish yellow will show up. It will highlight where it's waiting for. Okay, meaning that, oh, I finished running all those three lines. You yeah, ask me to break here, I'm waiting right here. So it will highlight the whole line, be like, I'm waiting. What do you want me to do? Your computer, uh, your VS Code will give you the options above. There are six different options. The first one is continue to my next breakpoint. A lot of time in the later on when you see me live that when you see I have a lot of breakpoints. So it will continue to the next breakpoint and wait for me there. Or you can step over one line at a time. Okay, so step over, which is this one, will run one line at a time. This is step into. Step into is when you are running a function, and that function is defined as of main, right? Function is defined somewhere else. It will go into that function and then debug over there. Step out is that you're inside a function. You don't want to debug this function anymore. Jump back out to main. That's what the step out means. You'll run the rest of the function, jump back out. Rerun is that, OK, never mind. It's not going to work. Just run it again. So it will rerun, and then finally stop. Those are all the options that you have for debugging. All right? On the left. While you're debugging, it will track all of your variables with their values. This is super helpful. Okay. I know exactly what my variable is at line 9. If I do step over, I will then know this will change. Maybe, maybe it will change, depends on what line 9 do. That's 
it will go to the next line and then tell you what the value of text is just now. So it will update as you go. So when I see that, you can see this just live streaming. One thing I want to point out is this variable app. Depends on your system. Whenever you create an integer i without, so you see this is waiting at line 9, meaning that I have not run this first. I have not run it yet. I have not run i equals to 0. But we do have an integer i in my code. It will allocate a random number, completely random, to your i. Do you want it to random? You probably want it to random into 0, ideal. Right? Your computer may do that sometimes. My computer may do that sometimes. When you're starting your project, I don't know what your project is going to do. Okay? So if you don't initialize your variable, you're completely relying on my grader's luck to see whether your variables are initialized correctly. Like a hint, most likely not. Okay? Most likely, it will give me dust. And be like, okay, I'm ready. I'm 32766. What do you want me to do? At one? Okay. 32767. No, I want it to be one. No, no, you, you said me to be randomly initiated. So it will just randomly initiate. So please, please, please make sure you initialize all of your integers to a number, either 0, 0, 0 0.0, whatever that number should be. Initialize it. Otherwise, I guarantee you're going to be like, Professor, you. Subtracted this many points because my code doesn't give you the right value, but it does on my computer. I'm going to show you. You're like, yes, I know it does, right? Because you're probably using Visual Studio, that could be one thing, or you're probably using a VS code with some configuration in there that's standard default to zero. I don't know what happened, but if you don't tell it to be zero, most likely it will not be zero to start with. It will be three, two, seven, six, six. A lot of people lose part for yeah. their project. In this case, what we can do, since it's uh, oh, this is fine. Yeah, this the is reason, fine. Yeah, yeah, the reason that is random number is because I say, yes. hey, don't run it. Yeah, yeah, okay. The minute it finish line nine, mm -hmm. it's gonna be zero. Yeah. yeah, but do you want us to stop yeah. there so to show you, mm -hmm. like, it's random. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Don't count on it. Completely random. All right. Yes, I have a slide dedicated to this. Mm -hmm. That it's random. Okay. But okay, let's see the screenshot where if I click step over, it's gonna jump to line 10 and that will change the view. Because I finished line 9, which I said in I equal to 0, so it's fine now. Okay, so yeah, so remember to initialize it. This example, so after you figure out the first one and you can do the line by line, this is to help you figure out what does step into means. So I create an example with a function, and I call that function at line 16. You can do that at home. You can do whatever inside that function. You don't have to read it like that, but if you want to, you can do that. All I'm trying to show you is that when you're at line 16, if you do step over, it will run that function, get done with that, go to line 17. But if you do step into, it will from line 16 over here, jump to here because you ask it to get into whatever function that is calling, go into here, step over, you can step out, you'll jump back to here, or you can just step over, step over, finish running, come back, and step over. Yes? Is there a way, okay. is there a way to go halfway? So if you have an if statement, for example, and like a very, like a compound conditional, is there a way to debug with looking at only part of the conditional, for example? So going halfway through a line instead of doing an entire line? No, that is why a lot of the time we write debug code in there. So if you want to inspect a portion of your variable or a portion of the calculation, you put it in a new variable. You put it in a what? In a variable, a new Vari variable. Oh, okay. Tech or debug mode or whatever it is. That is the only way you have a show on the left. That's the only way you can pause. Okay. Thank That's you. also why we don't encourage people to write compounded line. Especially for the Python user out there who like to write, put all your code in one line. <coughs> it looks great. It's long. 
you have one line of a project. You cannot debug it, it's not readable. You're gonna, I'm gonna guarantee that at one point you come back and be like, what did I do here? And then you're gonna break it into 10 lines and be like, oh, much better. Okay. So that is also why we don't want to have compound statements because you cannot debug it. It's only one line. Yeah, so you cannot do the first portion of the line, but you cannot do one line at a time. Uh, also, uh, when we declare uh, strings, string variables, mm -hmm. uh, it's also recommended to initialize some, like yes. empty string or, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That. yeah. yeah. Okay. I always do not like to take my chances. So, so anyway, always declare, initialize. My luck is whatever. not really, yeah. really, yeah. really bad. Okay. So I don't rely anything on that on my work. It's not So yeah, I try to initialize everything. Always. But for a string, it's mostly okay empty string because you are also gonna always gonna do assignment. Yeah. So like if I initialize it and I do output equal, oh I, I do output mm -hmm. plus equal. So yes, for this time I do need to because I'm appending. Mm -hmm. Most of the time for a string or something like that, you do equal, so it's gonna override it anyway. Mm -hmm. But this is a habit of mine. Any other questions? Yeah, so when you step out, it's going to jump out of the function. Um, yeah, and go we'll try that out at home. Uh, if you want to stay, we are just a little past that on that time. If you want to stay and try to configure your laptop, if you have that, I'm going to be here to help you. Okay, you can just raise your hand, I'll go to you and see how I can help you with. If you want to wait till next time, completely fine. Okay, but the week after that, you probably want to start to that is when you need to have it ready. So you have two weeks to get it ready.